So right now we're looking at a Flash game that was developed at the University of Utah called Mouse Party. And Mouse Party is a very useful tool for exploring the impact of drugs on the brain, specifically um, seven different uh, recreational drugs that you may have already heard of before. So I'm going to select this mouse over here, um, and it's consumed some heroin, and we're going to take a look at what's happening in its brain right now. So we're zooming in on the brain, we're getting real up close, and we can see some synaptic activity. So we see some neurotransmitters being released, and they're attaching to some receptors here. So, before heroin enters the system, inhibitory neurotransmitters are active in the synapse. These neurotransmitters inhibit dopamine from being released. So normally, an inhibitory neurotransmitter is being released, and it prevents dopamine from being active. Um, so dopamine is not being released here. And just for a later note, we have an opiate receptor here, and this is where dopamine uh, would be acting on this receptor. So now we have a native opiate that's coming and attaching to that opiate receptor, and now we don't see the release of that inhibitory neurotransmitter, but we do see the release of dopamine, and now it's able to act on that dopamine receptor. So, when the body's natural opiates activate opiate receptors, the release of inhibitory neurotransmitters is shut down. Without inhibition, dopamine can be released. So because this native opiate, the opiate that's naturally found in the body, is acting on this opiate receptor, the neurotransmitter that normally prevents dopamine from being released is no longer being released. Therefore, it's not acting on this receptor, so dopamine ends up being released, and it acts on the dopamine receptor here. So now heroin's coming in the next, and it's um, activating this uh, opiate receptor. And now we see a similar scenario in which dopamine is being released into the synaptic cleft and is able to act on these receptors. So, heroin mimics natural opiates and binds to opiate receptors, turning off dopamine inhibition. Dopamine is allowed to flood the synapse, producing immediate feelings of sedation and well-being. So here we have heroin is acting on the opiate receptor instead of the natural opiate. So, Neurons with opiate receptors are in parts of the brain responsible for transmission of pain signals, stress response, and emotional attachment. Our body's opiates are natural painkillers, effective when we've had sustained massive injury. For example, you might have heard of morphine, which is a drug that's fairly similar to heroin. So this is why morphine, a drug related to heroin, is used as a painkiller. So now we'll eject the heroin mouse and we'll explore some other mouse here. So this mouse here has consumed some ecstasy, so let's see what's going on in its brain. Alright, so we're zooming in and close, we can see some neurotransmitters here, and these are some transporters, and they're taking that neurotransmitter back up into the presynaptic cell. So what does this say here? Serotonin transporters are responsible for moving serotonin molecules from the synaptic cleft after they have done their job. So what we saw here were serotonin neurotransmitters, and this is a serotonin transporter. So in normal activity, serotonin is released and it acts on these receptors, but then when it's all done, it's taken back up into the presynaptic cell by these transporters, so it can be recycled and used again. So now we have ecstasy coming into the mix, and now it's moving through the serotonin transporter and seems to be having some kind of effect on them. So, ecstasy mimics serotonin and is taken up by serotonin transporters. In fact, ecstasy is more readily taken up than serotonin itself. So, instead of taking up serotonin, now it's taking up ecstasy. So now we see these serotonin uh, transporters are actually ejecting serotonin from the cell, which is odd. This interaction with ecstasy alters the transporter. The transporter becomes temporarily confused and starts to do its job in reverse. The transporter starts transporting serotonin out of the cell. So instead of taking serotonin back into the cell like it normally does, it's now ejecting serotonin into the cell. So now there's more serotonin here and it's going to act on these serotonin receptors. And that's exactly what we see here. So the excess serotonin becomes trapped in the synaptic cleft. As a result, it binds again and again to the receptors, overstimulating the cell.
So you may have heard of something called a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, or an SSRI. So this is the same kind of action, um, but it also has this whole ejection serotonin effect. So not only is serotonin not being taken up because ecstasy is being taken up instead, but it's also ejecting serotonin into the synaptic cleft. So ecstasy affects serotonin pathways responsible for mood, sleep, perception, and appetite. Ecstasy also indirects, indirectly interacts with the reward pathway. The excess serotonin stimulates a milder release of dopamine along the reward pathway, giving ecstasy slightly addictive properties, which can be a little bit dangerous. So now we'll release this ecstasy mouse and go explore another drug. Let's explore marijuana. So meaning on the brain here, we can see another neurotransmitter release scenario. So this is an inhibitory neurotransmitter acting on some kind of receptor here. So before marijuana enters the system, inhibitory neurotransmitters are active in the synapse. These neurotransmitters inhibit dopamine from being released. So now we're preventing the release of dopamine using inhibitory neurotransmitters. But um, unlike the uh, heroin scenario, instead of having an opiate receptor here, we have a cannabinoid receptor. You may have heard marijuana referred to as cannabis, and that's because it's the more kind of a scientific name because cannabis um, contains cannabinoids, which um, are a important neurotransmitter, which we'll explore in a moment here. So here's anandamide, and that is a native cannabinoid. So a cannabinoid normally found in the body. So when activated by the body's own native cannabinoid, called anandamide. Cannabinoid receptors turn off the release of inhibitory neurotransmitters. Without inhibition, dopamine can be released. So similar to the heroin scenario, we have um, anandamide acting on this cannabinoid receptor, which prevents the release of this inhibitory neurotransmitter. Without the inhibitory neurotransmitter, there's nothing acting on this receptor, and therefore dopamine is relieved in the synaptic cleft, and it acts on the dopamine receptor. THC, so this is um, the cannabinoid uh, famously known for its psychoactive effect um, for marijuana. So it's the marijuana cannabinoid here. So THC, the active chemical in marijuana, mimics anandamide and binds to cannabinoid receptors. Inhibition is turned off and dopamine is allowed to squirt into the synapse. So inhibition is turned off because of the action of THC on the cannabinoid receptor these neurotransmitters aren't released, and therefore um, there's no inhibition on the dopamine release, and therefore the dopamine can act on these dopamine receptors because it's released into the synaptic cleft. Anandamide is known to be involved in removing unnecessary short-term memories. It is also responsible for slowing down movement, making us feel relaxed and calm. However, unlike THC, anandamide breaks down very quickly in the body. That explains why anandamide doesn't produce a perpetual natural high. So part of the effect of THC is that it doesn't break down as quickly as anandamide. And so we have this kind of more constant, more intense effect instead of the very quick effect that happens from anandamide. So I'll release that marijuana melts and we'll explore another drug here. So let's look at methamphetamine. So methamphetamine is usually just referred to as meth. All right, so we have another reuptake scenario here. We have something being taken up by transporters into the presynaptic cell here. So dopamine transporters are responsible for removing dopamine from the synaptic cleft. Because meth mimics dopamine, it is taken into the cell by dopamine transporters. So meth has been taken into the presynaptic cell by these transporters, the dopamine transporters. Now meth is entering the synaptic vesicles and kicking dopamine out of the vesicle. So once inside the cell, meth enters the dopamine vesicles, forcing dopamine molecules out. So what happens there? So now dopamine is being ejected from the cell via the dopamine transporters. So the excess dopamine in the cell causes the transporters to start working in reverse, actively pumping dopamine out of the cell and into the synapse, which is 
Um, definitely not typical behavior. So now the dopamine is available to act on these receptors. So the excess dopamine becomes trapped in the synaptic cleft. As a result, it binds again and again to the receptors, overstimulating the cell. So instead of the dopamine being taken up back into the cell, it's now being released um, in excessive amounts into the synaptic cleft, and that's why we're having a lot of activation of these dopamine receptors. So meth is a highly addictive um, substance because it works directly in the brain's reward pathway, making the user feel intense pleasure and exhilaration, which is part of why meth is so dangerous. So let's eject this meth mouse and we'll explore another drug here. All right, so let's explore alcohol, which um, I'm certain more of you are familiar with um, in Western culture. All right, so now we have another um, inhibitory neurotransmitter situation here. So inhibitory neurotransmitters, called GABA, are active throughout the brain. These neurotransmitters act to control neural activity along many brain pathways. When GABA binds to its receptor, the cell is less likely to fire. So this is a GABA inhibitory neurotransmitter. It's binding to the GABA receptors, and that's preventing activity in that postsynaptic cell. So meanwhile, in another area of the brain, there's something else happening. It's this neurotransmitter being released, and instead of inhibiting this cell, it seems to be exciting it. So meanwhile, in another area of the brain, another neurotransmitter called glutamate acts on the brain's general purpose excitatory or acts as the brain's rather, acts as the brain's general purpose excitatory neurotransmitter. So unlike GABA, which inhibits cells, glutamate excites cells, causing more activation instead of less. So now alcohol is coming in the mix and it's acting on these inhibitory receptors, so these GABA receptors. And it seems to be enhancing the activity of those receptors. So when alcohol enters the brain, it delivers a double sedative punch. First, it interacts with GABA receptors to make them even more inhibitory. So it's enhancing the effect of these GABA receptors, enhancing the effect of the neurotransmitter GABA. Alcohol seems to be blocking these glutamate receptors. So now glutamate can't act on those receptors. Second, it binds to glutamate receptors, preventing the glutamate from exciting the cell. So it's preventing the excitation of the cell by blocking the glutamate receptors. Alcohol particularly affects areas of the brain involved in memory formation, decision making, and impulse control. Which is why when people are drunk, or when people have taken alcohol, they're more likely to make poor decisions, act impulsively, and if they imbibe enough, they may prevent um, memory formation, which is what we frequently call blacking out, or just having a fuzzy memory of the night before. So let's eject the alcohol mouse there, and we'll explore another drug here. So this is a mouse has consumed some cocaine, so we'll see what happens in the brain of this mouse here. So we have another reuptake scenario here. There's a neurotransmitter being taken back up into the presynaptic cell by transporters. So dopamine transporters are responsible for removing dopamine molecules from their synaptic cleft after they've done their job. So this is the dopamine transporter, and these are the dopamine neurotransmitters. Or neurotrans yeah, neurotransmitters. I thought I said neurotransporters. Which I guess is kind of what this is. Anyway, <laughs> let's move on. So now cocaine is blocking this transporter. So now dopamine is remaining in the cleft instead of being taken back up into the cell. So cocaine blocks these transporters, leaving dopamine trapped in the synaptic cleft. As a result, dopamine binds again and again to the receptors, overstimulating the cell. So now the postsynaptic cell is being activated by dopamine because it's not being able to be taken up. Its, its reuptake is being inhibited. So we're enhancing the effect of dopamine, basically. So like other drugs, cocaine concentrates in the reward pathway. However, it also is active in the part of the brain controlling voluntary movements, 
This is why cocaine abusers are often fidgety, or unable to be still. So let's eject the cocaine mouse there. And now we'll look at a mouse who has consumed LSD, which is commonly known as acid. LSD molecule here, and instead of anything complicated happening, it's just directing acting on this receptor. So, LSD acts almost exclusively on serotonin neurons. LSD chemically resembles serotonin, and elicits its effect by binding to serotonin receptors. So it's directly acting on these serotonin receptors, essentially mimicking the effect of serotonin in the brain. There are several types of serotonin receptors in the brain. Each is responsible for performing specific functions. So there's an example of one receptor type and another. There's some LSD, it's moving in, it's acting on these receptors, and something different seems to be happening in each one. LSD interacts with particular receptors, but not always in the same way. Sometimes LSD may inhibit them, and sometimes it may excite them. This is one reason why LSD has such a complex sensory effects. So in this case, on the serotonin receptor type 2, LSD is binding to the serotonin receptor, but it's inhibiting the activity of this cell. Whereas serotonin type 1 receptor over here, LSD is attaching to this receptor, and it's activating this cell. It's exciting the cell. LSD and other hallucinogens excite a particular region of the brain known as the locus ceruleus, or LC. A single neuron from the locus ceruleus may branch into many different sensory areas of the brain. The locus ceruleus is responsible for feelings of wakefulness and evoking a startle response to unexpected stimulus. So we'll check the LSD mouse there. And I think that was the last one. Well, I know I really enjoyed about doing Most Party when I first went through interest psychology, and I hope that you guys had as much fun as I did. Um, have a great guy, guys.